Wow, and the church said? Amen. Boy, um, I had my eyes closed in that whole time. It wasn't because I was praying for my wife to make sure that she can sing through all those ranges, but it was because I was visualizing what the lyrics were talking about. You know, going back to the old Jerusalem when the Shekinah glory filled the temple and people would come and they would see the majesty and the glory of God and how powerful that was. People would come from all over the world just to be in the presence of God. And then Jesus comes and the shadow is cast and the temple is rent inside. No longer do we need a priest to go into the, the uh, most holy place because Christ is now our high priest. And the angels were singing, hallelujah, glory. We don't have to sacrifice anymore because Jesus is our sacrifice. We are covered by the Lamb of God. Amen? And the song takes us into the future, which we're still waiting for. The new Jerusalem. And in that new Jerusalem, we look and we see the 12 gates. And no one is denied entry into the city as long as you're covered by the blood of Jesus. Amen? And so when I was listening to the song Angela was singing, I started to get moved by the Holy Spirit. I was thinking to myself, man, I look forward to that day. How about you? You know, we've had a lot of trouble in this world. I've been talking about it since last year. The great controversy in heaven brought to this planet, and we see it perking up right now. The massacre there in Texas. The horrendous weather patterns happening all around the United States and around the world. What is the answer for that? We see a great famine that is not going to hit just one location on the planet. It is now going to be global, a global famine. It reminds me of the days of Joseph. But God says, don't worry. I got you covered. You'll be well fed. God will take care of his people. But only if you're sealed. Only if you can claim Jesus as your personal Savior. Without Jesus, you're in trouble. You're going to have to rely on yourself. And let me tell you something, your money is only going to go so far when the economy collapses. Don't worry about the economy because God is your world bank. Don't worry about the food because in your pantry, God will send the ravens. Don't worry about your children because God loves your children more than you do. We pray for your children, we pray for our families, but we gotta leave them to God. Worry about yourself. Worry that you get into the new Jerusalem, amen? amen. Last week we um, had a chance to explore a very deep subject in scripture that very few people ever have a chance to look at, and that is time before Christianity. Now, those of you who are here listening for the first time, I invite you to go to the Chandler Media Ministry site on YouTube and, and watch um, the series of sermons that we have been leading up to this time. Uh, last week was part one, today is part two, and today I'd like to take a look at a very important topic discussing the 12 gates of the New Jerusalem, the 12 gates of heaven. Now, how many of you agree that the Bible is inspired by God himself. Now, if you raise your hand and you actually believe that the Bible is inspired by God, that means that there's nothing in Scripture that is wasted ink. There is a reason why things were written in here and why you have it in your hands today in 2022. You see, there are some scripts that aren't in the Bible. Maybe God doesn't need you to know those things. Because God just needs you to get saved so that you can ask God later these questions and hypotheticals. The Bible you hold in your hand, it doesn't matter what version you hold, there is some words of truth that you need to know. And I guarantee you that today, it is not by accident that you are here listening to this sermon. Because God needs you to know something before we enter into the kingdom. Now, last week when we were together... We took a look at part one, and I'm going to ask my guys in the back there if you can help me switch out this thing. It's not working again. So it always happens every time I have an important subject to, to talk about. My remote is not working. 
So let's go ahead and advance me one slide, and then Bob, if you can come on down here. By the way, um, many of you don't know that the thing that makes things happen for those of you online is the AV team here. And so I want to thank them. Let's give them a round of applause, everyone. Okay. All right, let's take a look at a review. Go ahead and just, um, just go ahead and just hit the enter button for me. What did we learn last week? So what we learned last week is that the Jews, can you read that okay? Wherever you are, those of you watching online can see this a little better. But the Jews, we see, were the chosen people of God. They were to demonstrate to the rest of the world what it was like to follow God. We as Gentiles, those of us who weren't born an Israelite, those of us who weren't born into the tribes of, of the Jews, had nothing. We had to depend on learning the oracles of God. We had to learn from the Jews about the covenant agreements in order for us to be brought into the citizenship of Jerusalem. So we as Gentiles had nothing. Then, later on, we discovered in my sermon last week, go ahead and advance to the next slide, um, that it was through Jesus' blood when he died on the cross that we became a part of Israel. And we were um, brought into the citizenship of Israel because we were adopted. We were adopted. Now, those of you who um, have moms and dads, thank you, um, are very fortunate. Some of you who don't have moms and dads, that's okay, because you see, we're all adopted in the family of God. And when God sees us as his children, he doesn't distinguish between what is blood and genetic, but rather what our heart and spirit has accepted. And so we were adopted into Israel because of the blood of Jesus. And the question that we ask is, will God still use us today as spiritual Israel? Will he still use us today as he intended to use Israel in the past? Well, let's take a look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. I'm going to use the, the, um, the um, English Standard Version, but you can use any version here. It says, but you are a chosen race. That means that you were in the mind of God. You were chosen. You are a royal priesthood. So not only are you priests and priestesses of God, but you are considered a part of a monarchy. You have been stamped by God as royalty, which means that you hold the title of prince and princess. Okay? You're a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people for his, his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellence of him, God, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Verse 10 says, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. So will God use us today as he intended to use the Israelites of old? And the answer to that is yes, absolutely. Which means that today you have to see yourself now as spiritual Israel. So everything written in the Old Testament actually applies to you. Look at what he says in John 4, 22. Jesus is teaching, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation comes from the Jews. And we discovered last week why Jesus made that very controversial statement that salvation comes from the Jews, because he came from the Jews, and salvation came as his sacrifice. The oracles of God were given to the Jews. The covenant agreements were given to the Jews. And the promise of the expansion of the human race that would end up in the New Jerusalem was given to Abraham. And Abraham had a child named Isaac, who had a child named Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, who then created the 12 tribes of Israel, which means that your great-grandfather is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you are children of the tribes of Israel. Now, if you're not sure about that, let's take a look at um, this question then, if that's so, must we be born a Jew in flesh in order to be saved? Do we need to be born as a Jew in order to be saved? Because it says that salvation is from the Jews. Well, clearly, clearly we see in Romans chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, as Brother Juan read this morning, a person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision 
merely outward and physical. So God is no longer interested in your genetic ties to Israel. So don't worry about what's going on in the Middle East and Israel. God has expanded his view of the whole world now. And so he says, he's not looking at the outward. Verse 29, no, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of what? The heart. So are you circumcised in the heart? Have you cut something from your heart and given it to the Lord? Has God been able to tear your heart in pieces so that way he can enter in? You see, there are many things that God can do. He has power to do many things, but one thing he won't do is crash the door of your heart. You have to open it from inside. He gave you the free will choice. And so teach your children in the ways they should go. And we pray that they will not depart from it. But if they choose themselves to depart from it, you leave that to the Holy Spirit and you keep praying for them. But God is not going to crash down their hearts. He still gives them the freedom to make those choices, just as he's given you the freedom to make your choice. By the Spirit, not by written code is how God sees us. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but rather from who? From God. Jesus says, don't let the left hand know what the right hand is doing, which means that you do things not for the glory and praise of others, but for the glory and praise of God the Father. And what does it mean? How can you not know what the right hand is doing? What God is saying is, after you do good, don't worry about it. Don't even think about it. You just keep on moving and do what God has inspired you to do. Don't give yourself the praise and glory. All of that has to go back to Jesus. All of that has to go back to God. And that's a hard thing for some of us to do, amen? So we are not Jews in flesh, but rather in spirit. To be a member of Israel means to be a what? An overcomer. Do you know, Jacob, you read it, you heard it, you, you studied it in, in our Bible study this morning. Jacob means supplanter. You see, we were born supplanters we're always striving for our own we want to gain for ourselves but god in that struggle with jacob he became trusting and humble and he relied on god and he became an overcomer over himself through the struggle and the and the, and the power that god gave him and so god changed his name from jacob the supplanter to israel the overcomer which means that if you are a spiritual israelite you had to overcome, overcome something. You had to overcome something in your experience that God has made you now a spiritual Israelite, an uh, overcomer. If you do not want to be a member of Israel, you have no covenant agreement and you are not circumcised. If you want to stay outside of God's people, that is your choice, but you are outside of the covenant. Therefore, no heaven for you. No heaven for you. Why can't those who do not accept Christ enter the heaven's gates? If you decide that you don't want to be a part of spiritual Israel, if you decide that you don't want to claim the blood of Jesus, that's your choice. But without Jesus, there is no heaven for you. If you're not a part of God's people, you are outside of the gates of Jerusalem. So why can't those who do not accept Christ enter heaven's gates? Take a look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 10 through 12. Revelation chapter 21, verse 10 through 12 tells us, And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem. It was coming down out of heaven from God. So we are talking about a time frame, not now, but we're looking at a time even after the millennium, after the second coming is done. And we see that the heavenly city is coming down from heaven on the new earth. And it's shown with the glory of God. And its brilliance was like that of a very precious jewel, like a jasper, clear as a crystal. Verse 12, it says, it had a great high wall. And on that high wall, he saw 12 gates. And with the 12 gates had 12 angels standing at the gates. Many times we think when you make it to heaven, there's only one pearly gate with St. Peter standing there. 
There is nothing in Scripture that says that St. Peter is hanging out at one single gate. According to my Bible, it says that the Holy City has 12 gates. And there are angels that are standing guard over those gates. And on the gates had a very specific inscription over the top of the gate. And inscribed over the gate were the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 tribes of Israel. Now, I want you to take note of something here. Each gate has the name of one tribe of Israel. The gate that you enter into is the, is the gate that your character best fits the tribe that you belong to. And I'm going to stop here for a minute, and I'm going to tell you this, that many times we have these romantic ideas that at the second coming, when we go, that we as families, my wife and my children, are all going to enter in to the same gate. We believe that we're going to be together with our loved ones coming into the heavenly city, but there's nothing in scripture that says that you're entering the city as a family. You're not entering into the city as a family. You're going in as an individual because of your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Your family is not going to save you. So those of you who feel that you're going to be buried next to your spouse that was a godly person, and when that person goes up to heaven, you're going to grab that person by the foot and hopefully you make it in because you're holding on to the, to the leg of that person. That's not how it works. Okay, so here we see that the gate has 12 names inscribed. And so we're now going deeper into why God needs us to know this. Because it's in scripture. Here's a question for you then. Where will you enter if you do not belong to one of those tribes? If you do not belong to one of the tribes of Israel... This is why the Old Testament is filled with, with semantics and verse after verse after verse that says if a stranger is not adopted into the tribe of Israel, they are outside the gate. They are excised from the people because God was teaching us something, that you have to be a part of God's people to enter into the kingdom of, of, of heaven. You have to have a citizenship in heaven to belong there. And if you don't belong to one of the tribes, what gate are you going to enter in? You're going to dig underneath because the foundations are made of pearls and all precious stones. You're going to take a lifetime to get under there. You can't go on a helicopter over the top and be dropped into the city. You're going to have to go in through one of those gates. Now, let's take a look at this. If you're not convinced yet, take a look at Revelation chapter 7. Now, you remember the scene, the four angels are about ready to loose upon the earth the four winds of strife. But God sends another angel from the east with a seal. And he says, hold on, do not destroy the planet. I need to seal my people, God's people, with the seal of God. And so we pick up here in verse 4 through 8. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed. Now, I want to make sure that we're on the same page. I don't want you to get caught up on the numbers, the 144,000. If you're interested in the 144,000, go back and search the archives. I did a sermon on the 144,000. I'll talk about it in the future sermon. Don't get bogged down. Don't let Satan bog you down in the 144,000. I want you to look at two other things. Number one is who is being sealed? And why are they being sealed? Okay, so don't focus on the numbers, but take a look at the names. Take a look. Those on the planet being sealed in the year 2022 until the time of Jesus' coming in the next few years are not going to be marked by the denomination that you belong to. In other words, God is not saying 12,000 Catholics, 12,000 Seventh-day Adventists, 12,000 Muslims, 12,000 Buddhists. It doesn't say that, does it? It says, from the tribe of who? Judah. So in other words, God still sees people through the lens of spiritual Israel. Through a tribe, the tribe of Judah, 12,000. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad. From the tribe of Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, Benjamin. Now I want you to take a look at that list there. Pay particular attention this morning to the details of these scriptures. Here in Revelation 7, verse 4 through 8, we see the 12 tribes of Israel being sealed at the end of time. So that way, at the second coming, God knows who he needs to reap from the planet to go into the kingdom. Now, let's take a look at this list again. 
One thing I want to I want to say throughout the history of the 12 tribes as we see it in the Bible if you look and you study the Bible over and over again you begin to see a common thread begin to develop from the tribes of Israel we notice that the natural development of every human being today follows on the track of one of the tribes in other words your personality and characteristics best fit one of the tribes and the and the things that you had to overcome is similar to the things that that tribe had to overcome all make the same mistakes and will receive the same treatment if you're faithful they will attain to the same reward if rebellious to the same type of punishment we've seen it over and over again through the history in the old testament of the 12 tribes so let's take a look at this what one characteristic will be shared by all the tribes? Revelation twenty two fourteen. 14, I'm reading from the King James Version, tells us, Blessed are they that do his commandments. Some of you have versions that says, wash their robes. Okay, your robes are dirty. Isaiah says, come to me. And though you, your sins are like scarlet, scarlet, I will wash you, make you white as snow. The way you get the washing is through the, the filter of the commandments. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have a right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. So every member of the tribe of Israel, every one of us, every one of you watching online, everyone who wants to enter into the kingdom has to have one qualification. You will be a commandment keeper. And if you are a commandment keeper, that means that you are obeying all of God's commandments. So those who say that God crucified the law to the cross is not reading their Bible. Because if God crucified the law on the cross, then no one is going to be saved. Because the only people who will enter into the kingdom according to God's own mouth are those who keep the commandments of God. I didn't say it. I didn't tell you to worship on the Sabbath. I didn't tell you to not murder. I didn't say any of these things. God told you to do those things. And I'm only repeating what God needs you to know, that if you want to enter into the new Jerusalem, you have to be a commandment keeper. No ands, no ifs, and definitely no buts. Doesn't matter where you come from, doesn't matter where you believe, doesn't matter what your traditions are, doesn't matter that your grandparents and your parents and your great-grandparents did one thing, God doesn't care about that. He cares whether you have a relationship with him and you're doing what he asked you to do. You're not going to be saved by your family or your traditions. It's time to strip the church play game away now. Jesus is coming again. Get serious about it. Get ready. Strip those titles and the traditions that we're so used to. And get ready for Jesus to come. Amen? Amen. Those who enter are those who keep God's commandments. God said it. So let's take a look at the tribes in Genesis and let's do a quick comparison. In Genesis, we notice that Jacob had 12 sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and who's the final one? Benjamin. There's the list. Now, we notice really something very fascinating in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, thank you, Brother Uchi. Okay, I appreciate that. Brother Uchi saw me preaching, and he noticed spit wasn't coming out. <laughs> he said, oh, pastor needs some water. He's, he's frothing at the mouth now. He needs more water. Okay, let's take a look at Revelation. In the ceiling before Jesus comes, he noticed Reuben was there. Simeon was there. Levi was there. Judah was there. But something interesting happens. Dan is not mentioned. And it's replaced by one of the sons of Joseph, Manasseh. Then we see Naphti, uh, that Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin again. So the, the obvious question is, something must have happened from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation, something happened to the tribe of Dan, where Dan is now outside of the gate. His name is not even written on the gate. 
and it's replaced with one of Joseph's sons, Manasseh, the older one. So what happened? Real, real quickly, Dan is missing from the list of sealed tribes in Revelation. Judges chapter 18, verses 1 through 31, please write that down. I'm not going to take time today to read it, but that tells the story of how the people of Dan fell into gross idolatry. As a matter of fact, it was so bad that later the people of Dan never repented. They never established a, a relationship with God, and they actually established two pagan worship centers. You see this in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 25, and you can read it all the way through verse 33. Sadly, Dan's man-made worship centered on, of all things, as if they didn't learn their lesson from Exodus, they chose the golden calf as their god. And that became the tribe of Dan's lasting legacy. The last thing you hear about Dan is that they were idol worshipers and they chose the golden calf. Okay, some people just don't learn. You could be saved, but they can choose to be lost. Now, I'm going to stop here and let you know. Those of us who believe that just because you were adopted and because you're doing commandments and because you're a part of spiritual Israel, you think that you're making it into heaven, don't fool yourself. It is a daily walk with Jesus Christ. Once saved is never always saved. Once you're saved is hallelujah, praise God. Now, how can I stay abiding in Jesus Christ? If we believe that once you accepted Jesus as your personal savior, now you can go out and commit adultery, you're fooling yourself. It is a daily walk with Jesus because we see that a whole tribe of Israel lost their salvation. They're not even listed on the books of heaven. They're not even written as an inscribed gate in heaven. God completely wiped them off. Not because God wanted to, but because they chose to follow Satan. They chose to disobey God. And so God is not going to crash down their doors of their heart. He's going to allow them the consequences of their own decisions. God wanted Dan to be saved, but they chose for themselves to exclude themselves from the citizenship of Israel. So let's take a look at the characteristics of the 12 tribes. Now, where do we find these characteristics? It's predominantly found within two areas of the Old Testament. We find it first at Jacob's blessings with his sons, the 12 sons. And we find that in Genesis 49. Then we see the second area where that blessing and the, and the prophecy, the metaphor, the allegory of God's people in the last days is expanded on in Deuteronomy chapter 33, where Moses is now giving the blessing. Now, I want to show you the first one. Let's take a look at where we begin to see the characteristics of the 12 tribes. Here we see in Genesis chapter 49, verse 1, Jacob called his sons and he said, gather yourselves together that I might tell you that which shall befall you when? In the last days. You see, this was not a blessing that was just in the here and now, but God gave Jacob the vision of foresight. And he looked down through the decades and the, and the millennia to the time of the end. And God gave him a vision. He says, every one of you, my sons, will have a track that you will follow that will lead to the end time. And let me tell you the track that will take you to the second coming. When we look at Moses, this is the blessing that Moses, the man of God, pronounced on the Israelites before he had died. In other words, before God was going to bury him, you know, they still don't know where Moses is buried because God himself buried him. They don't know where his grave is. They think it's in Jordan at Petra. They believe that Petra is actually the site where Moses was buried. But they're wrong because only God knows where Moses was buried. And here we see that God gave Moses some insight on how now those 12 individual sons of Jacob will turn into a people who follow a track all the way down to the end of time. Now, here's what I'm going to have you do. We're going to look at each tribe. We're going to go through this fast. But I'm going to ask you right now to look at your own life. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. 
I'm not going to ask you to make a testimony and get up and proclaim all the things that's gone in your life. I want you to, to tear apart your life and look in the mirror within yourself. You know what you've gone through. You know the challenges that you've gone through. You know what God has done for you and got you through some of the things that you have got, gotten through. And why you are actually listening to this sermon today. What got you here? There was a track that you followed. Here's what I'm going to have you do. As I'm going quickly through every one of the tribe and their characteristics, it's filled with prophecy and metaphor and allegory. I'm going to break that wide open so you can understand it. But I want you to identify for yourself what tribe do you belong to? Because I guarantee you today, everyone listening this morning belongs to a tribe. So let's find out. Let's take a look at Reuben. This is the standard of Reuben. Genesis 49, 3 and 4 says, Reuben, you are my firstborn. You are my might. The first fruits of all my strength. Preeminent. In other words, you are above all in one problem, pride. You are preeminent. You are above all others in power. Might. Strength. Power. Prideful. With all of that strength and might and power, you are still unstable as water. You shall not have preeminence, even though you are first in all these other things. You will not have preeminence because you went up to your father's bed. You were not able to hold back your addiction. You weren't able to hold back the temptation. So you went to your father's bed and you defiled it and you went up unto my couch. Let Reuben and Moses then, years go by, but in spite of that, let Reuben live and not die. And let not his people be few in number, but be many. Does this sound like someone you know? Mighty, strong, powerful, prideful, and unstable. With all of the power, they don't know which direction they're headed. People included in this tribe are characterized by might, strength, pride, and power. But they have been unstable as water. They are prideful. Therefore, they lack the power in themselves to find the stability and the humility. Thus, they are spiritually, these individuals are mentally and emotionally feeble. They are emotionally and mentally weak, incapable, and unable to overcome their very own addictions. They cannot gain victory over the battles of life, even with all their power. But they're a tribe of Israel. They overcome. They overcome because they found Jesus. And the blood of Jesus covered all of that. It's in their weakness that they earnestly search their hearts to discover God, and they discover humility, that in spite of all their strength and power, that there's someone that's greater and more powerful than them, and that's the God of heaven. And in their own weakness, and by God's grace, these individuals take these weaknesses. God takes the weaknesses, and they are turned and changed into strength. They are changed into victory. This is what it means to be spiritual Israel with all the po power, the might of Reuben, but unstable, we find the victory in Jesus Christ. And only then in our weakness do we find the true strength, do we find the true might of the almighty God. Is this you? Is this you? Simeon, the tribe of Simeon. Genesis 49, 5, 7 says, Simeon and Levi are brothers. They are in a gang together. They work together. Their swords are weapons of violence. All right, those of you who have Smith & Wesson M&P 2.0, 9 millimeters, those of you who love knives, those of you who love blow darts, anything that has a weapon attached to it, that might be you. Let me not enter their council. Let me not join their assembly, for they have killed men in their anger. Now, we have a problem. Take the weapon of violence and add anger to it, so much so that they hamstrung oxen as they please. We're going to talk about that. Cursed be their anger, so fierce and their fury, so cruel. 
I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. What does it mean to hamstrung oxen? Hamstringing is a method of crippling a person or an animal so that they cannot walk properly by severing the tendon behind their leg. In other words, they're hobbling around. That's cruel. To take down your enemy and not kill them and to make them weak and maim them using your, your anger and your, your, your weapons of violence to injure people. It is used as a method of torture to, to, to incapacitate their victims. This is what Simeon is described as. This tribe of individuals are characterized by ferocity. They're angry all the time. They're furious and they're cruel. Maybe some of you know people like this. Can't control the heat of their temper. Violent all the time, taking bats and hitting the wall because they got upset because you said something to them. Going outside and punching the walls, creating holes everywhere. Always worried that they're going to kill somebody. You know someone like this, maybe? But Simeon's sins were overcome. They were confessed and they were forgiven. They are overcomers. In their confession, these individuals found a forgiving and they found a loving God. So what happens? From fierce anger, they found God of peace. From the fury of their lives on this planet Earth, they found the calmness of God. From their cruelty, God turned them to people of kindness and goodness. It's amazing what a person can go through as a young child, go through some horrible things, get thrown in prison, and then all of a sudden God does something to them there. They come out of that place becoming the best evangelist on the planet. I've seen it happen so many times. My own family comes from a family of warriors. Three generations of warriors in the martial arts. Our niece and Kempo, Kali, Using the karambit, my own great-grandfathers created weapons. And every generation carried on down to me was my inheritance. But God took that violence and created God-fearing individuals in my family. It had to be God to make that conversion. Maybe you know that that's you or maybe that's someone that you know. But this is still spiritual Israel. There is room at the cross for everyone. Amen. Levi. Now, many of you know Levi. Deuteronomy 33, 8, verse 11. Moses said, your thummim and your urim belong to your faithful servant. Do you know what a urim and thummim is? Those are the two stones that the high priest would wear on their shoulders. If I ask God a question and the urim lit up, it means yes. If, it, if God meant no, the thummim would light up. Boy, wouldn't it be nice to have one of those today? You know? Should I buy that house or no? Urim goes ding. All right, let's put down the money. You know, should I talk to my son and give that person a spanking? And the thumb dings ding. No. Okay, I'll send my wife in then. <laughs> right? Here God says your Urim, your thumb, implying that this is going to be a tribe. Remember, he's talking to an individual. This will be a tribe that will play a role of a high priest. You tested him at Massa. You contended with him at the waters of Meribah. He said of his father and mother, this is very important, I have no regard for them. He did not recognize his brothers or acknowledge his own children, but he watched over your word and guarded your covenant. In other words, Levi would be represented by individuals that said, my mother, my father, my brothers and my sisters, they ridicule me for believing a certain way, but I don't care. Because I have to hold true, and I'm a guardian of the covenant agreements that God has given Israel. I don't care what mom and dad say. God has called me to do something different. Is that your story? Ridiculed by your family because you worship on a different day? Because you believe a certain thing? But God is saying this tribe will be indicated by individuals who aren't impacted by other people's thoughts. They're not being bullied by peer pressure because they were called to watch over as guardians over the covenants of God's laws. 
He teaches your precepts to Jacob and your law to Israel. He offers incense before you and whole burnt offerings on your altar. Bless all his skills, Lord, and be pleased with the work of his hands. Strike down those who rise against him, his foes, till they rise no more. That's in Deuteronomy. When Israel faced the test at Sinai, it was this tribe that came through by remaining the only tribe true to God. Did you know that? At Sinai, it was only Levi that stayed true to God. Those who may be counted among the tribe of Levi, Levi will be characterized by those who can stand true to God's cause when others are falling. By the way, I don't know if you know this, but Aaron is a Levite. Moses is a Levite. So they were following in the footpath of the way that the tribes were going. Deuteronomy 33, 9 says, He said of his father and mother, I have no regard for them. Why? Why not regard your father and mother? I thought the Bible said to honor your father and mother. The father and mother that God is talking about is God. So they are more worried about God than the earthly. He did not recognize his brothers or acknowledge his own children. Your own children that you love. Why? Because they were set aside as guardians, as treasure keepers of all of the, of the truth of God. That's a big deal. These individuals separate themselves from their relatives to stand true to God. Maybe that's you. They are overcomers, and they are spiritual Israel. Judah, we're going to go through this fast now because I'm running out of time. Deuteronomy 33, 7, Genesis 49, 8 through 12. I have it on the screen. Those of you who are watching online, I hope you can follow this. And this he said about Judah. Hear, Lord, the cry of Judah. Bring him to his people. With his own hand, he defends his cause. Oh, be his help against his foes. Judah, your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's son will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub. You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lioness who dares to rouse him. And it goes on. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations shall be his. This is the first prophecy in Genesis that is pointing to Jesus Christ. Jesus descends from the tribes of Judah. The scepter that Jacob was given, this vision is a vision of the Messiah coming many, many millennia later. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. We're going to describe what that means. He will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. So what are we reading here? What is meant by tethering a donkey to a vine? What is meant by tethering a colt to a branch? Wash your garments in wine or washing your robes in the blood of grapes. And this is something that um, you have to understand in metaphor and what they understood, and that is this. This means that individuals will unite the simple individuals, like a donkey, to the true vine, which is the word of God. The message was to go to everybody, even the simple, and they will be grafted and bound and, and attached to the true vine, the word, which is Jesus Christ. For the product of the vine is what? You squeeze the grape, you get grape juice or wine. Of the word, God's word, what is it that saved you? The blood. Both are saving potions, wine and blood. This is why Jacob was given this metaphor, this parable. Because here we see that the wine was to bring healing to the body. And the blood was to bring salvation to the soul. You see, God is interested in the whole person, mind, body, and soul. So when God said Judah is going to have the ability to bring this kind of healing, it's going to come through the scepter of one who will bring the ultimate healing to all humanity, Mind, body, and soul. There's no way that you can do it on your own. You need Jesus. Amen. You need him to save you. Yeah. Not only your soul, but he's going to make you a different body. Yeah. 
And you get that different body not because you stood in line asking for it and giving him a ticket. No, you get the new body because you are coming with the blood of Jesus. And this is why we do communion, the grape juice. Why do you drink the wine? Symbolizing what? The blood of Jesus. You see how it all comes together now. The very first prophecy of the communion, the very first prophecy of Jesus is coming from the very prophecy he gave through Judah and its line. Genesis 38 outlines the sins of Judah, though. He departed from the brethren in disunity. Maybe some of you know individuals that like to do that. We don't like what's going on in the church. We don't agree with what's going on in the conference. So we're just going to break off and form our own thing. Judah, the love of the world. Yeah, I can go to church on Sabbath, but man, the 49ers are playing today. And I got some money down on that. They got to win by so many points, and I'll, 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 get, I'll, I'll, I'll get $100. Or I'm going to party tonight. I, I, I wish I could worship with you guys on Friday, but, you know, Friday night, man, that's when that band is playing and they have the rave and it's going to be really cool. All the cool chicks are there, right? Love of the world, that was Judah. Evil in the sight of the Lord. Did not love his brother. Evil intentions. You know, it's one thing to say it in your face. It's another thing to say it in someone, to someone else about that person. Evil intentions, always working behind the scenes adultery, hypocrisy, okay? Now I know everyone's minds are going, now I know, I know all kinds of people like this. They're coming from, of all tribes, Judah. With all these sins, the miracle of divine grace takes place. In fact, Judah and Tamar and their offspring are listed in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that? You all know the story there? Horrible story of Judah and Tamar. And yet, Jesus is proud to list them in the, the, the genealogy of his own line, which tells you something, that Jesus is in the business of forgiving sins. In the end, these individuals will stand as overcomers, victorious over their sins. They are spiritual Israel. They will be recognized, gifted, and trusted leaders in times of perplexity. They will be trusted leaders in times of spiritual conflict. Maybe some of you know some of these individuals that have gone through some things in life and now have risen to the ranks of leadership. Maybe they are pastors. Maybe they are conference presidents. Maybe they are ministry leaders. Maybe they are elders. Maybe they're de um, deacons. Maybe they're consulate officers. But somehow God has taken them and their experiences and placed them in a, in a, in a place where they will unite all of God's people under the word of God using their testimonies of how they overcame themselves. This is what I'm saying. Do not just preach the Bible. You've got to tell your testimony and how God has worked in your life. Amen? Amen. And God will use these individuals to bring salvation to the soul. All right, we're going to go real fast here. We're on Zebulun, and I'm only on tribe number five, and it's 1252. This is why I have to get on the, on the, are it okay if I go a little bit longer? Are you guys okay with that? Okay, if you need to get up and drink some water, go ahead and do it, but I got to deliver this message today. Let's take a look at Zebulun. Zebulun will live by the seashore and become a haven for ships. His border will extend toward Sidon, or Sidon. Okay, Genesis 49, 13. Now that is 100% metaphorical of something else. We're going to circle back on this. About Zebulun, he said, Moses, Rejoice, Zebulun, in your going out, and you, Issachar, in your tents. They will summon people to the mountain and there offer sacrifices of the righteous. They will feast on the abundance of the seas, on the treasures hidden in the sand. So you notice that Moses is using the same metaphors that Jacob was using about this thing about the seashore and ships that come into the seashore. What in the world are we talking about? And how in the world does this even relate to anything? Let's break it open. Upon entering the promised land, Zebulun failed, here's their sin, they failed to drive out the Canaanites that were living in Kitron and Nahalal. Although Zebulun did subject these Canaanites to forced labor. 
So God told them, make sure that you take out the Canaanites. And what did they do? They created slaves. They were slave owners. This was incomplete obedience to God's clear command to drive out all the inhabitants of the land. Likewise, today, individuals in this tribe will tend to not respond fully to God's word. In other words, they'll go only so far and then they deviate with their own plan. Do you know what I'm talking about? You know, I'll take, I'll take the Ten Commandments and I'll follow all nine, but that one I'm just not going to keep. 99% lost, I always say, is 100%, or 99% saved is 100% what? Lost. Oh, so here we see Zebulun. These are people who don't fully respond to God's word. They go halfway, and then they deviate in their plan. Like Zebulun, these individuals choose to follow their own paths outside of God's will for many different various reasons, many of which are not in concert or in unity with God's own wishes. Do you recognize some of this? Maybe God had a plan for you to go into ministry, but you decided that you were going to keep barreling ahead and become a doctor. That's my testimony. And I wasted years going to law school, going to business school and getting my MBA. I spent years doing biomedical research on my way to go to medicine, and all the time God needed to call me into his own service. How many times did God call you to do something and you keep deviating off of God's path because of something you want for your own self? In the end, they stand victorious, spiritual Israel. These individuals learn to wait on God's word. How many of you have learned now to wait on God? Amen. Zebulun. They learn to wait for God's word and doctrinal truth that come like waiting for ships that bring precious goods and treasures into the seashore on ships. They stand waiting on the seashore for these precious truths to come in. These are Zebulun, tribe of Zebulun. These are people who, who wait for the word of God to hit them. And when they find them, they share it with everyone. They will call people to God as soon as they learn about these treasures. And they will reveal reveal these hidden treasures found in the sands of God's word. How many of you have discovered some new things in the Bible and you're so excited, you have to say, look what I learned, look what I found. Anyone have that experience? You're waiting for it. God gave it to you. And then you said, I got to get it out to everyone. Anyone have that experience? If anyone had that experience, you're from the tribe of Zebulun. Like Zebulun, when the enemies of God are numerous and aggressive, this group will expose themselves to reproach and even death. They will take one for God's people. They will take one for God. They don't care about their own life. They only care about the treasures that God is bringing in on the ships from the ocean. Some of these will handle the pen of the writer and will wield a wide influence bringing victory to the cause of God. Because of the truths they found, they will start to write it in manuscripts, in books, and it will be distributed around the world. I wonder if Sister Ellen White is from the tribe of Zebulun. I wonder if Brother D.L. Moody is from the tribe of Zebulun. And the many great theologians that have come to teach us many of the spiritual truths, maybe they come from the tribe of Zebulun. Issachar. Issachar is a raw bone donkey. Boy, how would you like to be called that? <laughs> Lying down among the sheep pen. Wow. Not only is he a raw bone donkey, but he's lazy too. When he sees how good his resting place and how pleasant is his land, he will bend his shoulder to burden and submit to forced labor. So when they know that they have it good, only then are they, you're going to see them work. Do you see, do you see uh, that in maybe some of your children? You know, you do this, you're going to get an allowance. Oh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it a little extra. My son, last night, we all went to bed. We had dishes after our, our Sabbath dinner. And uh, we woke up this morning, and all the dishes were clean. It's like, did the angels come down and clean our dishes? What in the world happened? So my wife, Angela, she texts me, and she says, good morning, sweetie. 
thank you so much. And she took a picture of a nice, clean sink. And I, I was a little confused, and I didn't know what to say. And I said, okay, you're welcome. I didn't know what was going on. And I discovered this morning that it was my son, Karsten. He got up at 12.30 in the morning and said to himself, I don't want my mom to worry about the dishes. So he got up and he washed all the dishes, all the pots, all the pans. He started the dishwasher and he organized it and I couldn't believe it. And then he said, well, how much money am I going to make from doing this? You know, my son's from the tribe of Issachar, okay? <laughs> the image of a donkey lying down between his burdens indicate that those in his tribe are known to be stubborn, and they crouch between their burdens to keep from having to work. Okay, maybe some of you know that. Look into yourself, too. The men of Issachar are described really clearly in 1 Chronicles 12. So write that down. You can read that for your own private family worship. The 200 chiefs of Issachar were faithful to David as described as those who understood the times and they knew what Israel should do. Now, when we think about 1 Chronicles 12 and, the, and how Issachar is described here, it seems as if these individuals um, had a special ability to know how to work the political environment. They may have even had the insight of prophecy. The characteristics of individuals in this tribe are like Issachar self-sacrifice they're willing to bear burdens in the end they stand victorious like israel and because they carry responsibility well they become pillars in god's cause they are steady these individuals in the tribe of Issachar are hard working and they are reliable rather than impulsive now one of the things that i teach my children is this saying fools rush in a wise person stops, assesses, prays about it, and then acts as God moves you. And no better illustration than that than going scorpion hunting at night. <laughs> Fools rush in. How many times do I rush in with my light back here, and then I shine it here only to discover a bright green scorpion that big right near my foot? Happened this week. Fools rushing in. Sometimes you need to have the light of God go before you, before you move. Because many times, many of us like to do this. Let's go do some work for God. And the light is back here. Don't put the cart before the horse. Let God lead us. Spiritual Israel, Issachar, these are people who are reliable. They're not impulsive. And they follow the, the will of God. Amen? Let's look at Gad, the tribe of Gad. Gad will be attacked by a band of raiders, but he will attack them at their hills. Hidden, all these hidden mysteries of language. Moses says about Gad, blessed is he who enlarges Gad's domain. Gad lives there like a lion. Look, look at this. This lion is tearing at the arm and the head. Okay, bad, bad. He chose the best land for himself. Do you know people like this? You get to, you get to choose, but I'm going to keep the best for me. The leader's portion was kept for him. When the heads of the people assembled, he carried out the Lord's righteous will and his judgments concerning Israel. Let's take a look at this. Gad's specific sin is triggered by influence of the tribe of Manasseh in their unfaithfulness to God. You'll read about that in 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verses 11 through 26. So in other words, these individuals are easily influenced by their peers. They're easily influenced by the unfaithful. Now, some of our children belong to the tribe of Gad. They need to be watched on how they're being influenced on social media and their friends. Others aren't influenced like that, like my daughter Cadence. She is not influenced by what other people think of her. Social media doesn't impact her at all. So she stays steady all the time. But not everyone is like Cadence. Many people lead themselves to where they're bullied, and then they commit suicide because of what others think about, what, about them, and th their self-esteem is torn apart. Well, the people of Gad are easy influenced as well. These individuals are territorial, like a lion and they seek to expand their domain, seeking only the best for themselves. Some of you might have some siblings that are like this, okay? 
You have some brothers and sisters, and every time you talk about a split of inheritance, it's horrible, right? I hear some people laughing because you know what I'm talking about. Now, love and kumbaya until you have to talk about your will of your, of your deceased parents, right? Gad. These will maim and injure others, but they will acknowledge their actions, repent, confess, and reclaim God. So they will remain this way, but they gain victory because they acknowledge their actions, they repent, and they reclaim their relationship with Jesus Christ. Individuals in this tribe arise from their tragedy. They arise from their defeat, and they use their trials as sources of victory. In the end, they will overcome their unfaithfulness, and they will stand victorious as spiritual Israelites. And in the end, these individuals will end up carrying out, as the Bible says, all of God's will and the judgments that God brings down. It will be the tribe of Gad that will be the execution of God's will and judgments in the end times. The tribe of Asher, we're almost done here. Asher's food will be rich. He will provide delicacies fit for a king. About Asher, he said, most blessed of the sons is Asher. Let him be favored by his brothers and let him bathe his feet in oil. What does oil represent? The Holy Spirit. The bolts of your gates will be iron and bronze and your strength will equal your days. So let's break this down. Despite all of its blessings, the tribe of Asher failed to drive out the Canaanites. Thus, the people of Asher lived among the Canaanite inhabitants of the land and they were influenced. We see this in Judges chapter 1. In the time of Deborah and Barak, Asher remained on the coast and stayed in its covers rather than join the fight against Jabin, a Canaanite king. So they decided to stay and live in comfort and not go and help their brothers. This failure to aid their fellow members indicate four things. These, this, is, this is what people in this tribe are, are characterized by. A lack of reliance on God. A lack of effort a fear of enemy, and a reluctance to upset those with whom they do business. People pleasers. People who don't want to upset the status quo. They fear what's going to happen. They don't want to get destroyed. And so they, they find themselves waffling back and forth between relying on God and relying on self. And although Asher was richly blessed, they did not behave admirably. When the time for action came, they failed to trust in God and honor his plan. However, these individuals will walk and bathe in the Holy Spirit, so much so that in the end, their delivery of the word of God through their testimony and experiences will be like delicacies at a king's banquet. It will be rich, exotic, powerful, and enticing. They'll use their testimony to bring people to God. In the end, they will be so filled by the Holy Spirit that even Satan and Satan's legions and the enemies of God cannot penetrate their homes, their souls, their families, or their minds because they are locked down with bolts of iron and gates of bronze. We all need to have that. There needs to be a little bit of Asher in all of us today. In spite of our weaknesses and despite of our waffling back and forth, in the end, we will still be overcomers. Naphtali, or Naphtali, is a doe set free that bears beautiful fawns. Wow, beautiful image. About Naphtali, he said, abounding with the favor of the Lord and is full of the blessings, he will inherit southward to the lake. You read this in the Bible, what does it mean? It means, first of all, Naphtali successfully conquered the region but did not drive out the Canaanites again, but rather subjected them to forced labor. So they, too, were slave owners. But we notice that this tribe was summoned by Gideon to fight against the Midianites. They were summoned by Gideon to fight the Amalekites, and they went and they fought. The tribe of Naphtali sent armed forces to Hebron, showing support for David's rule, as we see in 1 Chronicles chapter 12. So these individuals, when confronted with a call to action, they call up to action with arms, and they don't hesitate. Individuals in this tribe are gentle in character, though, like a doe. 
They are gentle by nature. Maybe some of you know. I know there are many members in my congregation that are gentle as a deer. But don't get them pissed off because they will go to war for God. I'm just saying, don't mess with the gentle because there's a fiery volcano ready to come out on you if you, if you, if you offend their God. These individuals speak goodly words, beautiful words, like fawn, the offspring of a beautiful doe. In difficult times and places, they stand strong and fearlessly at their posts of duty, ready to sacrifice their lives in God's cause. They are strong spiritual Israelites. Let's go to Joseph. Many of you know the story of Joseph. Genesis 49, 22 through 26 tells us the blessing that Jacob gave on the one son that came from Rachel that he loved so greatly, and he was sold into slavery. Joseph is a fruitful vine, a fruitful vine near a spring whose branches climb over a wall. With bitterness, archers attacked him. They shot at him with hostility. That's the story of Joseph. But his bow remained steady. His strong arm stayed limber because of the hand of the mighty one of Jacob, not because of Joseph's own strength. Because of the shepherd, the rock of Israel. Can you believe that in Genesis chapter 49, again, we get another prophecy about Jesus? The rock of Israel, the shepherd of Israel, it is Jesus, the mighty one of Jacob, the God that allowed Joseph to sustain all of his trials, going to prison, being falsely accused. And God still used Joseph in the end. Because of your father's God who helps you, because of the Almighty who blesses you with blessings of the skies above, blessings of the deep springs below, blessings of the breast and of the womb, your father's blessings are greater than the blessings of the ancient mountains. He's talking about God the Father. Then the bounty of the age-old hills, let all these rest on the head of Joseph, on the brow of the prince among his brothers. You remember the vision he had about all the sheaves bowing down. He became second in Egypt. The blessing of Joseph extended to all of his progeny that goes down into the centuries up to 2022. And Moses continues and says about Joseph, May the Lord bless his land with the precious dew from heaven above and with the deep waters that lie below. How many of you know people that no matter what they do, it seems like they're always able to, to drive BMWs and have super nice houses and have all of these blessings and they're so gentle and they're so forgiving. It's like they're Joseph. Always blessed with the best. The sun brings forth and the finest the moon can yield with the choicest gifts of the ancient mountains and the fruitfulness of the everlasting hills. This is Joseph, with the best gifts of the earth and its fullness and the favor of him who dwelt in the burning bush. Who are we talking about? Who was in the burning bush? Jesus himself, God himself. Let all these rest on the head of Joseph, on the brow of the prince among his brothers. In majesty, he is like a firstborn bull. His horns are the horns of a wild ox. With them, he will gore the nations, even those at the ends of the earth. Such are the ten thousands of Ephraim, such are the thousands of Manasseh, his two sons. I want to focus real quickly in the time we have left on verse 23 and 24. With bitterness, archers attacked him. They shot at him with hostility, but his bow remained steady. His strong arm stayed limber. Joseph had a problem. He was conceited at his youth, causing dissension among his family. Many of you may have been a cause of such a thing in your own family. Many of you may know someone like this. Joseph was hated by his brothers, sold into slavery, as we see in Genesis 39. Joseph was falsely accused of immorality and sent to prison. How many of you have been falsely accused of tax evasion, falsely accused of having done something that you did not do, and you were innocent? You're from the tribe of Joseph. But Joseph had one thing that you need to have, and that is trust in God, even if you're thrown into prison and falsely accused, and maybe your ex is trying to tell you that you're crazy, so they're trying, he's trying to take your children away. If that's you, you're from the tribe of Joseph. Stay true 
and trust God. The people of this tribe are marked with one common theme, and that is these are people with integrity. And because of that integrity, they never fail in their loyalty to God. They're committed deeply to doing God's will, and they are patient, they are long-suffering, and like Joseph, no matter what happens, they can still forgive at the end. Whew, that's hard for some of us, to forgive someone that falsely accused you. You hear stories about that, though. People who experience the murder of their child, and they go to the person who killed their child, and they say, I forgive you. That's a Joseph act. That is from the tribe of Joseph. Then we come to Benjamin. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, he devours the prey. In the evening, he divides the plunder. About Benjamin, he said, let the beloved of the Lord rest secure in him, for he shields him all day long, and the one of the Lord love rests between his shoulders. Ravenous wolf devours prey in morning and divides plunder at night. Now, let's think about this. Think about your own life or think about someone. Someone who is ravening is, fero is ferociously hungry. So hungry, like a wild animal, that they become almost like a monster out of a horror movie. They will hunt their prey and make them for food. Do you know people like this? While a ravening wolf is fierce and brutal in its hunger, Ravening can also describe someone who acts wild or brutish in so many other ways. Isn't it amazing that God doesn't take the perfect person? He takes the imperfect people of Israel and he makes them overcomers and he gives them a right to enter into the kingdom. Benjamin's blessing has three parts, we notice. Compared to a wolf, the blessing has two time frames, morning and evening. It has two actions, devouring and dividing. And it has two outcomes, prey and spoil. And this sets up a type of before and after experience for Benjamin. In other words, you were one way, and now you're something else. And you can't explain what happened to you. The only thing you know that the thing that happened between those two places is Jesus Christ. A before and after. A before and after. Scripture shows at least four great individuals from Benjamin's tribe. Real quickly, Ehud, the great warrior who delivered Israel from Moab, Judges chapter 3. We also see Saul becoming the first king of Israel from the tribe of Benjamin, 1 Samuel chapter 9. Mordecai and Esther saving the Jews from death, Esther chapter 2. And finally, Paul, who is the greatest of all the Benjamites, found in Romans 11 where he says, I am from the tribe of Benjamin. At every one of these situations, you see a before and after, a ravening wolf who becomes something else. Yet Benjamin's tribe had its dark side. Their warlike nature came out not only in defense of their country, but also in depravity within their country. In other words, because of Benjamin, they created a civil war. They caused dissension. In Judges chapter 19, Benjamin takes up an offense against the other 11 tribes, and civil war ensues. You might see this in your family. There's that one sibling that always says something that causes everyone to start fighting. There's that one person in work. Everyone's getting along, but there's that one person that is a complete, I won't say the word, but you know, they're that kind of person, and you want to call them something, but you don't. You don't say it because they are always causing dissension in the office. Benjamin. Now, this period had a reputation where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. So because of Benjamin, they created splinter groups. People represented by this tribe have extreme turnarounds, a sort of before and after effect in their lives. Saul was a classic Benjamite, zealous, and he was dedicated to doing one thing, destroying Christians. But when he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus, he turned him around and he became Paul, the greatest missionary of all time. Now, how in the world does that happen? Wanting to kill a Christian and now becoming the greatest missionary, a true Benjamite, ravenous wolf. And then all of a sudden, God turns him for victory. Those in this tribe will have done everything they possibly could, they could do to spread the gospel. These are the true evangelists. I know several members of this church that are from the tribe of Benjamin. There are people in this conference and people in this union and division I know are true 
evangelists. They will do anything. They will come up with amazing ideas because they want to, sp to spread the gospel. Benjamin. Finally, the tribe of Manasseh. Thank you for hanging with me. We're finally on the last tribe. Many of you were saying, man, there's 12 tribes. I'm only on number five. And it's already one o'clock. Joseph called the names of the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my hardship in all my father's house. Those in the tribe of Manasseh are those who had a rough upbringing. Those who may have grown up in a cult. Those who were beat silly. Those who were, were um, tortured as a child coming up. And God made you forget all of that and learn that you had a bigger family. The tribes of Israel. The family of God. Maybe some of you have had a history where you feel alone because everyone has, has pushed you aside. God is saying that if that's you, maybe you belong through the tribe of Manasseh. And that is the gate that you will enter into. Gideon questioned God when called to save Israel out of Midian's hand. Gideon cried that his clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. Gideon is a classic individual representing the tribe of Manasseh. Gideon required proof from God twice before he acted. How many of you ask for proof from God all the time? I'm not going to do it unless God shows it to me. I need proof. I need to put my Gideon's fleece out there all the time. I was just talking to a brother. I won't say who it is. Just in the back here. I said, I didn't know exactly what tribe you belong to. I was asking for proof. Question, question. Hypothetical this. Tribe of Manasseh, that person is. Requiring an answer. Once convinced of God's will, Gideon moved forward. Not with thousands. He went with 300 troops. And he destroyed 120,000 Midianites. Those coming from the tribe of Manasseh do a crazy results for God. They'll take small numbers using no money, bad resources, and they conquer in great ways for God because God is with them. Maybe that's you. Individuals represented by this tribe love peace. They rejoice in the fact that they have been delivered from evil. Any of you been delivered from evil? All of us. There's a little bit of Manasseh in all of us. By the way, Manasseh is not true 100% Israelite or Jewish. Manasseh was known as the half tribe because the other half of them was, of all things, Egyptian. Egyptian, which means that even if you were outside of Israel, you could still be grafted in and adopted. This was God's way of saying that there's room at the cross for you. There's a gate in heaven for you. Doesn't matter where you came from. Doesn't matter if you're a Muslim. Doesn't matter if you're Buddhist or Hindu. There's still a gate for you. You could be half of this, but you still need Jesus to get in. That's it. What's so hard about that? Except Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and there is Manessa's gate for you. These individuals continually rejoice in those things that are spiritual. This is spiritual Israel. I'm going to close it out now. Here are the 12 tribes of Israel on heaven's gates. You see the 12 there. Because of their pride, jealousy, and self-centeredness, because of their wickedness and disobedience, because of the sins in their lives and their failure to turn away from them, the tribes of Dan and the tribes of Ephraim are not included among those sealed and inscribed on the gates of heaven. And I want to say this for those of you who are just now tuning in life. Once saved is not always saved. You have to stay connected to the vine. I want to thank everyone for hanging with me this whole time. It was a very long sermon, but I felt like this message had to be delivered. I want to close out with these last verses here. Galatians tells us, if you belong to Jesus Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, and you become an heir according to the promise that was given to him. You are spiritual Israel. 1 Peter 2, verse 9 and 10 says that you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of that darkness into his marvelous light. 
Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had no mercy, but now you have received all the mercy because you have been grafted into spiritual Israel. Amen? Here are the 12 tribes. Here are the gates and the names of the tribes of, of heaven. These are the banner standards of the tribes of Israel. And here is the million-dollar question. Which gate will you enter through? Which gate will you enter through? And my prayer is that as you consider the next several years, as Jesus is coming, is coming close, we see the signs happening all around. You have heard me talk about the great controversy. You've heard me talk about the mark of the beast. You have heard me talk about being sealed by God. But now today is the final message. This is the final message from the throne of God. Choose God. Choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. May the Lord add his blessing on this word.